Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So school started this week. Yeah. Uh, both our high schoolers rolled out of bed on Thursday morning. I want to say uh, 9 a.m. ish. Splash some water on their faces. Uh, turn on their Chromebooks and join their <clears throat> 9 a.m. online classes. Yeah, so going to class, getting textbooks, turning in homework, all looks very different this year. And even though this back to school season is super weird for everyone, I think students everywhere are still asking the same questions. Who are my teachers? And what are my classes? And the teacher, I mean, us parents, meanwhile, are asking, what are you going to learn this year, right? In the church, our teacher is always Jesus. And our central textbook, the Bible. But even though we may have read it before, there is always new learning God has for us. And this fall, the gospel readings in the lectionary feature Jesus as teacher. And the class might be called Glimpses of the Realm of God. Glimpses of the Realm of God or the Kingdom of God. And Jesus' lesson plan involves parables, stories that offer a vision of the kingdom or the realm of God, as well as just some straightforward lessons. And his original students were his disciples, sometimes uh, large crowds, and even at times the religious leaders. Yet this master class is one for all ages and all times. So in these next nine weeks, I invite us all to think of ourselves as students and Jesus the teacher. Let's put our thinking caps on and give thought to what these glimpses of God's realm can show us about God, about ourselves, and about our call to action in the world today. First, as a quick overview of the class, or the sermon series, I want to share a challenge given to our church and to every congregation in the Presbyterian Church USA at the 2016, 2018, and 2020 General Assemblies. In response to deep Bible study, prayer, and discernment about what these very passages in Matthew's Gospel that we're going to read in the coming weeks, about what they have to teach us, the three most recent General Assemblies have exhorted the whole PCUSA to act boldly and compassionately to one, eradicate systemic poverty, two, to dismantle structural racism, and three, to build congregational vitality. What our denomination is calling the Matthew 25 vision. So each week in this series, the lessons and parables of Jesus will show us glimpses of the realm of God, where the hungry and the thirsty are satisfied, where strangers are wrapped in welcome and where the body of Christ is strengthened and set free to serve God with joy. So each week, the text will invite us to focus in on one of those three areas, poverty, racism, and congregational vitality. It won't always be comfortable. That's just kind of the kind of teacher Jesus can be sometimes. Remember, he was crucified for what he taught. Okay, we ready? Today, we read from Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep 
than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. This is the parable of the Good Shepherd from Godly Play. And this story combines several images of Jesus as the Good Shepherd into one story. To save time this morning, I have already laid out our story, but with the children, as each piece comes out of the box, we wonder together what these elements of our story could be. Now we have introduced this character. There was once someone who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people followed him. And as they followed him, they began to wonder who he could be. Finally, they just had to ask him. So they did. One day they asked him, who are you? And he said, I am the good shepherd. I know each of my sheep by name. When I take my sheep from the sheepfold, they follow me. I walk in front of them to show them the way. I show them the way to the good grass. And I show them the way to the cool, clear water. And even when there are places of danger, I show them how to go through. And I count each of my sheep as they return at the end of the day to the sheepfold. And if any of the sheep were missing, I would go anywhere to look for that lost sheep. In the grass, by the water, even to the places of danger, and look for that sheep. And when that lost sheep is found, I would put it on my back and carry it all the way backly, backly, all the way back safely to the sheepfold, even if it was heavy, and bring it home safely. And 
then I am so happy that I can't be happy just by myself. So I invite all of my friends and my family and we have a great feast. Now, if we were to continue this story, we would introduce two more characters, an ordinary shepherd and a wolf. And we would talk about how the good shepherd keeps his sheep safe from the wolf, but the ordinary shepherd runs and hides when the wolf comes. And then when we're done telling our story, we wonder together. I wonder if these sheep have names. I wonder if the sheep are happy inside this place. I wonder where this place could really be. I wonder if you have ever gone to such a place. I wonder if you have ever found the good grass. I wonder if you have ever had the cool, clear, fresh water touch you. I wonder if you have ever had to go through places of danger. I wonder how you got through. I wonder if you have ever been lost. I wonder if you have ever been found. I wonder if the Good Shepherd has ever called your name. I wonder where this whole place could really be. And when our wondering time together has wound down, we pick up all the story materials and we put them back in our box, which will be gold. <laughs> and then we put it on the shelf so the children know where it is and are invited at any time to come and tell the story of the Good Shepherd. Yay for godly play! so fun to really put ourselves into the parables as the lost sheep, the shepherd looking and searching, the joy of finding and being found. That's a fun classroom to be in, isn't it? And yet that very next lesson doesn't feel quite as fun. If a brother or sister sins, go talk to them. If they don't listen, get two or three more friends to talk to them and confront them. And if that doesn't work, bring the whole church out. And if that doesn't work, then it's time to stop and let them go. Yeah, that one's a little more awkward. So these two passages are right next to each other. They're, they're, they should be treated as a whole. So what's going on here? What is Jesus teaching us about God, about ourselves, about our work in the world? Well, the first thing I want to say is this, about God. What, this, what is this teaching us about God? I believe Jesus is teaching us that God's heart is for reconciliation. The life of the one who is far from community matters to God. The vulnerable, those who are frightened for their lives, people living without protection of society, or who are marginalized by systems and laws made for the majority group. God says their lives matter. God's heart is that they be found and wrapped in welcome and given a place in the fold. Also, those who are stubborn, those who are self-absorbed, the difficult ones who have chosen to break relationship with God and others, Jesus is saying the same thing that God says their lives matter. And God's heart is that they be found and wrapped in welcome and given a place in the fold. And even that last part, verse 17, let's read it again. If the offender refuses to listen even to the church, that's my summary, treat them as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. We have to be careful with that because what the Jews did with Gentiles and tax collectors was basically leave them alone. 
not tie them up and torture and execute them as the church decided to do with the Inquisition and witch trials and with anyone who disagreed with church doctrine for centuries. And they would use this passage from Matthew as justification. But that's not the right interpretation of this. That is so misleading and misguided because if you push on this even just a little bit, you have to ask, what did Jesus do with Gentiles and tax collectors? Oh, that's right. He healed them. He welcomed them. He even invited a tax collector to be a, a disciple and a friend. In the realm of God, all will be reconciled. That is what Jesus is teaching in these, this parable and in this lesson. That in the realm of God, all will be reconciled. So the second question we want to ask in any Bible passage, and we'll ask it in this one specifically, is what does this teach us about ourselves? Well, I think it's saying, <clears throat> sometimes we're the sheep in the pen, comfortable, and wondering why God would bother with the one that got lost. Not understanding what it's like to be lost, or frightened, or living outside the margins. But sometimes, we're the ones who are lost, or wandering, scared, not sure why we're alone, and wondering if anyone cares about us. Asking, do we matter to God, to the rest of the fold? When will someone find us and help us and wrap their arms around us and welcome us back? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, we're the stubborn, willful person who has insisted on our way and won't listen to anyone else. When confronted by one person, we say, we didn't do anything wrong. When a small group of friends gently call us out, we double down and say, this is just who we are and we are not changing. And when God speaks through the whole church and our selfishness, our prejudice, is revealed. Instead of listening and repenting, we talk smack about our church and complain about the people who were brave enough to be honest with us. Yeah, we've all been there, haven't we? Seen that one play out. So, what is Jesus telling us about our work in the world? What is our homework? For this class. I think the most important lesson Jesus get, is giving us is that in the realm of God all will be reconciled and reconciliation is rooted in relationship. Let me repeat that. Reconciliation is rooted in relationship. The shepherd didn't blow a whistle or throw a rope around the lost sheep. He didn't share a Facebook post about how stupid sheep are and that they should just follow the rules and stay in the pen with the rest of the sheep. No, the shepherd went out and found the sheep and with tenderness and comfort brought the sheep back. The work of dismantling racism means God is asking us to leave the safety of the majority group we may find ourselves in and be on the lookout for people who are not part of the in crowd or who are oppressed by systems that may benefit us, but not them. Immigrants, people of color, uh, the disabled. God is asking us to be willing to leave the comfort of our flock of friends and be in conversation with a person whose life experience is not ours, who can tell us what it's like to be in their skin, in their body, uh, with their cultural experience. The work of dismantling racism also means recognizing when we're the ones with the hard hearts. 
when God's when God sends people to us that show us the ways that the system works for us but not for everyone we are at, being asked to do the hard work the heart work of repentance of examination of educating ourselves on healing and repair and that happens best in relationship in the realm of God all will be reconciled and reconciliation is rooted in relationship so our homework is this be in relationship here are some ideas reach out to someone this week who you know is feeling lost or lonely send them a card give them a call see if there's a safe way to visit them in person is a friend on your Facebook page uh, making you angry with their political posts? Well, instead of posting your own angry retort, how about you give them a call? Ask them how they're doing. See how you might try to understand one another better. Yeah. Or maybe, are you troubled by what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement? I encourage you to have a conversation with a person of color in your life, in your neighborhood. Ask curious questions. Build relationship with them. Or read an article or a book that challenges you to examine perspectives that you have not seen before. To do the hard work of reconciliation. To commit ourselves to breaking down systems of oppression means going back to school for all of us, sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from our Lord the ways of relationship, repentance, and restoration. And the good news is that Jesus is not only our teacher, he is our friend and our helper. May we be faithful students and take our homework seriously for the sake of the world and to the glory of God Almighty. Amen.